I'm Tracy Sable tonight on EWTN News Nightly War and Remembrance. World leaders gather in France to remember the 80th anniversary of D-Day. We hear from a Catholic priest who attended the ceremonies. War in the Middle East. Dozens are dead after Israel targets a school that they say was housing Hamas terrorists. We have the latest. Protecting children. Learn more about an initiative aimed at stopping gender surgeries on minors. And a slideshow. How some fun-loving religious sisters in Brazil are making waves on social media. These stories and more tonight. From EWTN, the Global Catholic Network, this is EWTN News Nightly. Thank you for being with us on the Feast of St. Norbert. Our top story tonight, World War II veterans, world leaders, and thousands of others joined together today to remember a turning point in history as they mark the 80th anniversary of D-Day. President Joe Biden also made the trip overseas to commemorate the sacrifices made in France that saved the world from tyranny. White House correspondent Owen Jensen reports. So in Tracy, good evening to you. President Biden, the president of France, King Charles, and many others all honor the World War II veterans who took part in D-Day. As young soldiers, they waded ashore in Normandy through withering gunfire to battle the Nazis, a pivotal moment in the fight for democracy. Music plays as President Joe Biden and the First Lady arrive at the commemoration ceremony for the 80th anniversary of D-Day. President Biden says we're living at a time when democracy is more at risk across the world than at any point since the end of World War II. In their hour of trial, the Allied forces of D-Day did their duty. Now the question for us is, in our hour of trial, will we do ours? Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin adds we must rally again to defend the open post-war world of rules, rights, and responsibilities. Those rules protect us. Those rights define us. And those responsibilities summon us once more. President Biden met with some of the American veterans who were still able to make the trip to France. Their numbers are dwindling, with many around 100 years old. But their heroic actions on June 6, 1944, remembered with deep reverence and immense gratitude. You took all the risks for our independence and our freedom. We won't forget that. Thank you. President Biden applies those lessons from eight decades ago to current conflicts. He says a coalition of more than 50 countries is standing strong with Ukraine. And make no mistake, the autocrats of the world are watching closely to see what happens in Ukraine, to see if we let this illegal aggression go unchecked. Ukraine's president, Volodymyr Zelensky, and his wife received a standing ovation when they appeared at today's D-Day Remembrance. And while they were back in Normandy, 11 of the American World War II veterans were awarded the Legion of Honor. That's France's highest distinction. The French president, Macron, told them, quote, you came here because the free world needed each and every one of you, and you answered the call, end quote. At the White House, Owen Jensen, EWTN News Nightly. All right, coming up later in the newscast, we hear from a Catholic priest from the Diocese in Normandy who attended today's ceremony. So back here in the United States, more witness testimony in the Hunter Biden federal gun case. Today, the widow of Hunter's brother, Bo, took the stand, speaking about her romantic relationship with Hunter. Haley Biden testified that she found the gun that Hunter purchased in 2018 and tossed it in a trash can. Jurors also had the chance to hear from the gun store employee who sold the firearm in question. Prosecutors say that Hunter knew he had a drug addiction and lied on federal forms saying that he was not addicted when purchasing the gun. The president's son has pleaded not guilty. Additionally, today, President Biden said in an interview that he would not pardon his son if convicted. The Republican leaders of three House committees heading the impeachment inquiry into President Biden sent criminal referrals to the Justice Department. They recommended charges against Hunter Biden and James Biden for making false statements to Congress. 
Empress. Capitol Hill correspondent Eric Rosales has been following this story from the very beginning and joins us now with more. Eric. Well, good evening, Tracy. The GOP chairman and the Judiciary Oversight and Ways and Means Committees claim that the president's son, Hunter, and President Biden's brother, James, allegedly lied to Congress. Republicans say that this was an effort to cup, cover up the Biden family illegal profit-making business while Joe Biden was vice president. And now they're demanding the Justice Department officially bring charges. In a letter sent to Attorney General Merrick Garland and Special Counsel David Weiss, along with the 60-page brief, the chairman alleged the president's son and brother lied during their meetings with Congress in February. Quote, our investigation has revealed President Biden knew about, participated in, and benefited from his family cashing in on the Biden name around the world. Despite this record of evidence, President Biden continues to lie to the American people about his involvement in these influence peddling schemes. Reaction to the news came quick. Participating extensively in those depositions as I did, I think that Jim Biden likely provided false information to Congress, particularly regarding some of the China deals. And, you know, with Hunter Biden, I think it's the money laundering stuff. And I think there's, there's a lot of people that think with what happened right now with President Trump that the American people just want to move past this. Um, I think that there should be an accountability tool and mechanism. Democrats shot back. And they don't have any evidence of any high crimes and misdemeanors. And we spent uh, more than a year and a half uh, following every possible exit and detour with the Republicans, and they couldn't find anything. To me, it just seems like there's no end to what they would want to do. Uh, once they get the audio tape, then they're going to want the videotape. Once they get the videotape, they're going to want him to be polygraphed. Once he's polygraphed, they're going to want his health records. Speaker Johnson supports the referral, stating on X, quote, false testimony to the U.S. Congress is a felony. If the attorney general wishes to demonstrate he is not running a two-tiered system of justice and targeting the president's political opponents, he will open criminal investigations into James and Hunter Biden, and he will announce it immediately. By the way, the Justice Department is not obligated to address criminal referrals from Congress, but congressional observers believe that they should be taken seriously. Meanwhile, Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene, well, she's already filed impeachment articles against President Biden and says that she's currently talking with Speaker Johnson on what to do next. Tracy. All right. Thank you so much for that report, Eric. Well, a federal judge ruled today that an ally to former President Trump must report to prison by July 1st. Mayor Steve Garland Bannon says that he will fight the judge's order. Bannon was convicted in 2022 of two counts of contempt of Congress. One, for failing to sit for a deposition with the January 6th committee. The second, for refusing to provide documents related to Trump's effort to overturn the 2020 election results. Bannon was sentenced to four months in prison. While well, in Gaza, as more than 30 people are dead following an Israeli airstrike on a school that was sheltering displaced Palestinians. Witnesses say the missiles hit classrooms on the second and third floors. The Israeli military says Hamas militants were operating within the school but so far has not offered any evidence. A spokesman from the State Department said Israel is obligated to do everything possible to minimize civilian harm. But reports of the deaths of several children show that, quote, the results aren't where they need to be. And here with analysis is Eric Bureau, a retired Marine colonel and helicopter pilot who flew hundreds of missions in some of the most dangerous areas in the world, including in Iraq and the Gulf, uh, Persian Gulf, that is, and Somalia. And he is also the author of the book, The Ghosts of Baghdad. Colonel Buer, great to have you back on the show. We appreciate it. Uh, you have extensive experience dealing with this type of urban warfare. Your thoughts on this incident and what do you think happened here? Well, it's always difficult to tell. You know, initially, there's, a, there's always a jump to conclusion. Um, the, the real issue in Gaza is you're looking at 300 plus miles of tunnels that Hamas has built over the last you know, 15 years, and it intertwines the entire city. It, it does go through hospitals and schools, and they know it, they use it, they take advantage of it. But any war you fight in the urban areas is, is, is just so complex. If you look at uh, what happened in, you know, we'll talk about Berlin, or we look at the modern wars in Fallujah, Iraq. Uh, very, very difficult environment, uh, particularly when you have a large civilian population. Yeah, and as mentioned, um, Israel said they believed Hamas was operating within that school. How reliable do you think the intelligence is? And how challenging, if you can talk about this a little bit more, is it to collect intelligence in a situation like this where it's rapidly, you know, shifting these war zones? It's really difficult. So in their case, they're using drones primarily. They probably have some level of human intelligence on the ground. 
Uh, and Hamas is very, uh, you know, they're, they're very well aware of it. And so they're going to they're going to move um, where they're not going to be seen. They're going to operate where they're not going to be seen. Uh, they'll conduct strikes and then attempt to hide themselves among the population. And, and of course, they do it in hospitals. They do it in schools. Uh, they've been doing this since uh, the October 7th. Yeah, they really do conduct themselves, Hamas, that is in a non-conventional manner, and I'm sure that complicates efforts to fight them in this type of theater. Can you expand on that a little bit more? So you really, it's a violation of the Geneva, Con Geneva Convention, that is. It's a violation of the laws of war. Um, it's, it's really something we try to hold sacred um, when conducting war. Uh, you try to be hypersensitive to uh, religious, um, in this case, mosques or other places of of gathering, you try to be super sensitive and aware of schools, hospitals, any place where there's going to be civilians. Uh, Hamas has made it very difficult, very difficult for targeting. Uh, the Israelis are committed to this war, uh, and so what they're doing is they're looking for uh, those Hamas planners, and they, uh, they're going to. I think they will report in the near future that they were successful in taking out uh, some of the Hamas planners, but uh, you know, tragically, um, uh, they were doing that in, op in operating inside a school uh, under the blanket of the UN. Yeah, almost out of time here, about a minute or so left. Um, but as you know, there's a ceasefire proposal on the table right now. How likely do you think it is that both parties will come to an agreement and this fighting will end? And what do you think needs to happen in order to stop this bloodshed? So there's going to be an end to it. I mean, there's going to be some type of negotiated settlement. It, it, it will eventually come to an end. Uh, the Israelis, I don't think, will be satisfied until they get the leadership. Uh, they, they, we saw that in the 1st of April when they struck targets in Damascus. We see this now as they continue to go after Hamas. They just, you know, they cannot find a way uh, to live with these terrorists that, uh, you know, attacked again on, on the 7th of October. So it's going to be outside influences. It'll be the Saudis, uh, the Emiratis. It'll be the Omanis, we hope, will come in and get their neighbors together uh, and find a way to have a negotiated settlement. Uh, it's really going to be up to Hamas if they want this settlement to last. Um, and it's going to be up to the Israelis to show some restraint uh, as they get to the negotiating table. Oh, Colonel Brewer, uh, great to be with you as always. Thank you so much for your analysis. We appreciate it. So long. I have a lot more still to come here on EWTN News Nightly, including taking a stand. Learn why medical associations are coming together to try and end the gender surgeries for minors. Dozens of doctors and medical organizations are teaming up to try and end gender surgeries for minors. The American College of Pediatricians wrote the declaration. It calls on American medical institutions to halt, quote, current harmful protocols promoted for children and adolescents who express discomfort with their biological sex. It has been co-signed by more than a dozen organizations, including the Catholic Medical Association. And for more, we're joined now in the studio by Dr. Jill Simons, Executive Director of the American College of Pediatricians, and Mario Dickerson, Executive Director of the Catholic Medical Association. Thank you to you both for being here. We really appreciate it. Thank you Thank for you. having us. Absolutely. Dr. Simons, I want to start with you first. Why did you feel the need to write this declaration and why, why now? Well, the American College of Pediatricians uh, for years has been sounding the alarm about the dangers of these protocols that our medical institutions um, and organizations are endorsing. Um, and recent events in the last few months, the, namely the leak of the WPATH files and then the release of the CAS report in England, um, just had overwhelming evidence that these um, so-called gender-affirming care treatments should not continue. And um, we thought that our colleagues here in the U.S. would, would um, take heed and also do the same and put a pause, um, but they, they've not. They've continued. And so we just came together as a coalition of uh, medical doctors, organizations, and said, enough. Yeah. Why do you think that's happening? I mean, why do you think this agenda is sort of still pushing forward despite medical evidence otherwise? Um, it's a good question, and I don't know if I have the answer. There's probably many reasons why um, this is so entrenched and, um, and doctors, smart doctors, are not listening and, and seeing what we're seeing and making the same conclusions. Um, we just, we know um, a lot of physicians are afraid to speak out. Um, because they're being uh, reprimanded or threatened even, loss of job. So we know a lot of physicians are staying silent um, because of that. 
Uh, but we're hoping that with our leadership that uh, doctors will step out of the sidelines and speak up uh, and say enough. Yeah, and you had a lot of people that co-signed, a lot of organizations as well, like the Catholic Medical Organization. Um, tell us a little bit more association that is. Mario, tell us why CMA decided to sign on to this. Why was it so important? Absolutely. At, at the heart of it is protecting children. Uh, that's first and foremost. There's, um, you know, I think there's a study that it's, uh, you know, one percent. It affects one percent of the children in the United States. Uh, Seventy-two million children in the United States. So that's seven hundred twenty thousand children. But they're the children at the bus stops. They're the children, uh, neighbors down the street. You know, I have six children. You know, a lot of children might be struggling and not expressing it. And so we're really advocating for the children is the primary reason. But certainly, you know, we have physicians who have been uh, persecuted as well, threatened with uh, termination of employment for not, um, you know, caving into some of these uh, mandates that are coming out. So. Yeah, and, and do you know, um, are you aware, are there any Catholic hospitals that are taking part in this type of treatment? Right, I, I'm not aware of any Catholic hospitals uh, that are doing that, but we would certainly encourage them to sign this declaration and just reassure their patients that they are standing on the side of not doing any harm to their children and just making a public statement. There's, um, I think it's, uh, you know, it, 10% of the Catholic hospitals in the United States in 1995, and in 2016, it's 16% uh, of uh, the hospitals in the United States are Catholic. So if the Catholic hospitals and uh, health care systems were to sign on to this document, I think it would make a tremendous impact in health care in general in the United yeah, States. Absolutely, very important. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Simons, what do you hope comes from this, and what do you think will happen if we don't sort of reverse course on this type of treatment for children? Well, I'm very optimistic. I have um, faith in my colleagues, pediatricians and physicians around the country that we're going to do the right thing. I, I think a lot of people either are afraid or are you know, just not paying attention. And so this declaration is meant to um, get the message out there loud and clear. So I, I remain very optimistic that this is going to turn around. Yeah. And if people want to read this full declaration or get more information, um, how can they do so? So they can go to the website, doctorsprotectingchildren.org, and um, they can sign, they can read the declaration, see the list of co-signers, very impressive, um, and, uh, and sign themselves. Okay, wonderful. Thank you both so much for being here and for what you both do. God bless you both. Thank, Thank you. you. And up next on EWTN News Nightly, Fighting for Religious Freedom. A conference at the Vatican draws attention to the plight of those persecuted for their faith. Plus, learn how a French diocese is observing the 80th anniversary of D-Day. habits. This is what nuns wear to water parks. Yes, water parks. The Franciscans of God's Providence in Brazil recently posted an Instagram video of the sisters enjoying themselves going down water slides and just having an absolute ball. Check them out there dancing. I love it. And they are proving that you can make a splash in religious life. Well, a recent conference in Rome examined ways to protect religious freedom around the world. One Vatican representative says Christians are facing high levels of persecution for their faith. EWTN Vatican Bureau Chief Andreas Tonhauser has more. 4.9 billion people live in countries with serious or very serious violations of religious freedom. The numbers are shocking. The consequences are frightening. Here, the neutrality of the public apparatus in relation to the free choice of citizens in religious matters is replaced by an ideology intolerant of other beliefs, which are consequently marginalized to the point of disappearing from the public agony. The Vatican's foreign minister, Archbishop Paul Gallagher, spoke at the conference calling for a new global platform for religious freedom. He stressed that if the international community ignores the spiritual side of the human person, its concept of human development is incomplete. The defense of religious freedom can be understood as the defense of the truth of the human person in the face of constraints that might be imposed by fundamentalist religious groups or totalitarian states. It is so decided. Almost 10 years ago, the UN adopted the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. It is meant to be the world's roadmap for ending poverty, protecting the planet and tackling inequalities. The agenda defines 17 goals, but the speakers are advocating for the right to religious freedom to be included. Well, this, 
enough is never enough. Uh, it's clear that is not enough taken into consideration, even though it is a part of a very lively debate, and very often debated in all international fora. Last summer, the Atlantic's Council's Freedom and Prosperity Center unveiled indexes that measure the freedom and prosperity of nearly every country in the world. For the first time in decades, both are currently in decline. Religious freedom is, we believe, more than a human right. It's not more than a good in itself. It is part of what governments need to put in place to create a society that can thrive and become prosperous. And the numbers that we have in our data at the Atlantic Council, Atlantic Council Freedom and Prosperity Indexes show that religious freedom is at the lowest uh, in 30 years. Experts went on to explain freedom and prosperity are incredibly correlated. The freer a country, the more prosperous. The less free, the less prosperous. For this reason, they hope more country governments and voting populations will make use of the data to make better policy decisions for their people. The, that the hope is that countries and governments who look at this data will see clues as to what they might, levers they may pull to increase freedom and ultimately increase prosperity for their people. In Rome, Andreas Sternhauser, EWTN News Nightly. Uh, marking the 80th anniversary of the Normandy landings, the Pope reminded the world that disrupting peace in pursuit of worldly interests is a grave sin. In a letter to Bishop Jacques Hiver of Bayou and Lisieux, the Holy Father reflected that the memory of the war had once deterred leaders from provoking another global conflict, writing, I note with sadness that this is no longer the case today and that humankind has a short memory. May this commemoration help us to recover it. All right, now I want to bring in Vicar General Olivia Rufre of the Diocese of Bayou Luzu. Father, thank you so much for your time today. We really appreciate it. So what events has your diocese planned to commemorate the 80th anniversary of D-Day today? We have organized many events. Uh, first of all, I'm very pleased to, to talk with you today and to join so many people you, you, you can reach. So we had many events. And the first one we had uh, on the 28th of May, we had more than 2,000 um, uh, young pupils um, who joined uh, the, the beach of uh, Ouistreham, where the, the, the French soldiers land for the first time. And uh, they run for peace at uh, this place. And uh, they received a, a general from the army to, to have a, a witness of, uh, of what uh, uh, the army can do to, to get free. And then we had uh, yesterday, on the 5th of June, we had uh, an ecumenical uh, celebration in the cathedral. Uh, our bishop was there, and many bishops of France, too. And uh, it was a uh, celebration with the British uh, ecumenical um, uh, army. And uh, then we went to the British uh, uh, cemetery for uh, a remembrance uh, with Princess Anne, the Princess Royal of uh, England. And then the, today, uh, by this time we are talking together, uh, the, the bishops of Normandy and the other one are to the international uh, meeting in the Omar Beach. And uh, today also, uh, on the morning, we had, uh, had by the time of uh, the landing on France in June 1944, we, we had a mass celebrated uh, all over the seaside uh, on about eight places. And Father, why do you find it so important to hold these events? I think there are three reasons first. Uh, the first one is that we must pray for peace. Uh, the second one is that uh, uh, this, these events take place in the concert of nations. Uh, about uh, 11 nations uh, uh, came to, to France to, to make us free. And um, uh, the, the events uh, we have uh, take place uh, in this concert of nations. And the third one is like uh, the little flower said, you know, about St. Teresa. We are in the Diocese of Lisieux, the Diocese of St. Teresa. 
and she invites us to confidence and hope. And I think it's the moment for confidence and hope uh, for all over the world. Father, thank you so much. It really was wonderful thank speaking with you and sharing, the, sharing this moment with you. God bless you. Thanks very much, and God save America, and God save the world. Thanks. You must never forget, and we thank you for watching tonight. Remember, you can follow us on social media, Facebook, X, and Instagram at EWTN News Nightly. I'm Tracy Sable. Good night, and God bless.